Yes, thank you for that question. And the question was, if you didn't hear it on the other side of the room, was what um, efforts or what initiatives have been successful in re-engaging young people and helping them embrace uh, a spirit of civic responsibility. I'll try not to make any uh, disparaging comments about generation narcissists, the baby boomers. Oh wait, I just did, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, not my generation, not talking about my generation. Um, but I think, you know, the one thing that that, that really attracts people is simply the, just the, the beauty of the faith and the faith itself. Young people today are not interested in the battles of the 1960s. And whether that's the culture wars, communism versus capitalism, all the things that baby boomer pundits and activists get hung up on, young people are simply not interested in that. They want to be Catholic. They just want to be Catholic. They want to embrace the whole faith. And when you present them, um, uh, when you reframe politics, not just as this um, war of, of, of partisan interests, but the coming together and the way the church sees politics is you know, trying to find the common good and, and how do we work and live together? How do we order our lives together? And when you give them the beauty of Catholic social teaching, which they've been deprived of, we've all been deprived of that, uh, in many cases for partisan reasons, when you give them the beauty of the faith, that's attractive. And that's of course naturally so, right, is that um, the faith is beautiful. But more powerful than simply teaching are those people who are witnesses. Um, and when we present the witnesses of the faith and people who witness to the totality of Catholic social teaching, not just one issue or another, someone I think come to mind, Dorothy Day, someone who by baby boomers, no, no offense, is loved or hated uh, because neither of them have really read her in full detail or understand the witness of the Catholic worker community. But young people today, they long for that lit witness. They long for the integrity of the whole faith. And I think that is really effective. So not just the combination of, of Catholic social teaching and the teaching, but also effective witnesses as well. Yes, our Lutheran friend, hello. Thank you for that question. The separates, our general our friend asked what, you know, what's, talk a little bit about the separation of church and state and what that means, the myths versus the realities. Um, the separation of church and state in theory is a good thing. We want to keep the state out of the church's business. Um, this, the separation of church and state and the way it was articulated by Jefferson was not meant, of course, to keep religion out of public life or morality out of lawmaking. It was meant to keep the state out of the church's business. Why? because the churches and the religious communities had an important role to play in fostering the moral and social capital necessary to preserve and defend a free society. So far from saying we need to keep religion at bay because it might harm people or it might you know, create all kinds of psychological guilt, <laughs> we need to have religion to play a robust role in our public square because of the good that it does. It was Jefferson, the supposedly secular president, uh, who presided over the Sunday morning prayer services in the U.S. Capitol building. And his letter, um, he's, the, the separation of church and state comes from a letter he wrote to the Danbury Baptists, but it's all, the companion letter to that, one that he wrote to the Ursuline sisters in New Orleans is often looked where he really fleshes out this idea of separation of church and state. Again, to keep the state out of the church's business so that the churches can flourish. Our founders were smart. They had a lot of lived experience and understood that oftentimes religion and the cause of religion was undermined when it was co-opted by state powers. And so the solution was, was not to suppress religion, uh, but to get the state out of the business of religion so that religion could flourish in society. This is an authentic and positive, I think, development uh, in modernity. Um, and our founders really embraced this in the proper way uh, when they crafted the First Amendment and how they intended it to function. That's, uh, I appreciate uh, all the great questions and your attention and time on a beautiful summer evening, so thanks very much. And I'll, we'll certainly be uh, around to chat a little bit more. And we're the place today of apple pie. We're going to put in a plug not only uh, for the good work of the Minnesota Catholic Conference, but we also have network sign-up cards. You can join our Catholic Advocacy Network and receive periodic updates by email about legislative issues at the Capitol and Congress and easy ways to take action. So those network sign-up cards will be out by the apple pie uh, after the presentation. Th again, thanks very much. It was a blessing to be with you.
Thanks again, Jason, for all your words of encouragement. And thanks again to everyone for coming out here tonight to Light for Freedom speaker series. Um, I just want to thank all the people who promoted this event, Relevant Radio, the Archdiocese, the Catholic Spirit, the USCCB, Minnesota Catholic Conference, and the Church of St. Paul. Our next event in this speaker series will be on Wednesday, October 14th from 7 to 8.30 here at the Church of St. Paul. It will be part of the Minnesota Citizens Concern for Life, MCCL's fall tour. There is a free will offering basket for Jason on the table outside these chapel doors if you would like. And also please join us for that American favorite apple pie in the activity center. I want to conclude tonight's speaker series by joining together in prayer. So if you could take the little prayer cards that were on your chair, we will pray that prayer together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. O God, our Creator, from your provident hand, we have received the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You have called us as your people and given us the right and the duty to worship you, the only true God, and your Son, Jesus Christ. Through the power and working of your Holy Spirit, you called us to live out our faith in the midst of the world, bringing the light and the saving truth of the gospel to every corner of society. We ask you to bless us in our vigilance for the gift of religious liberty and give us the strength of mind and heart to readily defend our freedoms when they are threatened. Give us courage in making our voices heard on behalf of the rights of your church and the freedom of conscience of all people of faith. Grant, we pray, O Heavenly Father, a clear and united voice to all your sons and daughters gathered in your church in this decisive hour in the history of our nation, so that with every trial withstood and every danger overcome, for the sake of our children, our grandchildren, and all who come after us. This great land will always be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.